Hello everyone, my name is Claudius Gazan. In this video, we wrap up the harmonic analysis of the Johann Kruger's Chorale that we started two videos back. Uh, and we analyze the fourth line. Okay, I will also perform for you the number 41 from Robert Starr's Rhythmic Training Book and Solfege number 42. I'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. Let's take a look at line number three of the choral. The uh, uh, line that we also analyzed last time, just so we remember what uh, Mr. Johann Kruger does in here, and then we'll dive into the fourth line. Um, we looked at the third line, and we saw that he starts it with uh, the chord of the one, minor, moves to the chord of the six, which is major, chord of the three, which is also major, first in first inversion, then into root position, then the chord of the four, which is minor, back to the chord of the three major. And in this third measure, we also uh, uh, found out for the first time about passing tones. Passing tones are those non-chord tones that are approached and left by step in the same direction. And it first happens in the uh, tenor and then in the bass. Very simple non-chord tones to understand. And then, we saw that uh, Mr. Kruger is actually borrowing a chord progression from the relative major key, B flat major. Uh, by the way, this chorale is written in G minor, and B flat major is the relative major. And we uh, have here a uh, harmonic progression that goes from the uh, chord of the five of three to the B flat. Okay, so the way to properly notate this is with a slash notation. We're borrowing a harmonic progression from B flat major, a five to one relationship basically, but not in the original key of G minor, but in B flat major. Okay, B flat major is the chord of the three in G minor, G, A, B flat, okay? And he's borrowing this harmonic progression, um, this dominant to tonic um, harmonic progression. And the way to properly notate this is with a five of three, resolving to three, or the one of three, but we don't say one of three, we just say three, okay? So basically, it's just like a five-one relationship, but removed from G minor. So remember, whenever you borrow harmonic progression from another key, uh, temporarily, very temporarily, you notate these with the slash notation, okay? Um, great, so we have a, an authentic, a perfect authentic cadence in B flat in here, okay? And of course, we still have the uh, uh, suspension happening in here, the four to three suspension. And also, he's bringing the, uh, the octave through the seventh chord uh, before he resolves it to the chord of the three, or one of three, all right? Uh, which is very similar to the one that we had on the first line. The first one was in the key of G minor. This one's in the key of B flat major, all right? Let's quickly go in and analyze the last line in here. We have a chord here. The first chord is a chord of F major, okay? And remember one thing, F natural really does not belong to G minor. It does belong to G minor if you consider the uh, natural version, but we're talking about tonality here. We talk about uh, leading tones and so on. So the composer is really using F sharp, okay? when he wants to solidify G minor, okay? But since this is built on F natural, F A C, you have to wonder yourself, does he think here of another key? And he actually does. Remember, he's just given you a cadence in B flat major, a perfect authentic cadence in, F, uh, in B flat major, and now he's going back to the chord of the five in B flat, which is F A C. This is the chord of the five in B flat major, which is three in the original key. So that's why we call it the five of three, okay? So that's why it's called the five of three here. And F really functions more in B flat major than in G minor. Okay, let's take a look at the next chord. The next chord is uh, 
It's basically the same chord, but he moves to a different inversion here. He moves to the first inver inversion of that five of three chord. Why? Because you don't have the F in the bass anymore, which was the root. Now you have the A. The A is the third of the chord. Therefore, we notate it with a five Arabic numeral six, okay? which stands for first inversion. All right, very good. Let's go on to the next chord. And now, finally, you see the chord of B flat. B flat D F is the chord in root position, and that is definitely the chord of the three in G minor. Okay? So uh, that's easy. How about the next chord? Next chord is a chord built on E flat. E flat G B flat. Okay? Well, this could be the chord of the six. Okay, G, A, B flat, D, uh, B flat, C, D, E flat, okay, six in G minor, or if you still consider yourself as being in B flat, this is your chord of the four of three, okay? So I'd like to actually uh, notate it as the four of three uh, because uh, I haven't left B flat major yet. Okay, I'm still in B flat. All these chords up to this point function perfectly in B flat major. He gave us a cadence in B flat, so there's no reason to think that he's thinking right now going back to G minor. So let's keep it in B flat major until we find the chord that finally does not work in B flat anymore and tells us, okay, now you're back in the original key of G minor. So I'd like to analyze this as the four of three instead of the six. Okay, remember this one works well, this particular chord works well in both keys, in B flat as well as G minor. But since we were up to this point in B flat major since the last cadence, let's keep it this way. So I'd like to analyze this as the four of three. Three being the B flat major that we've been, you know, dealing with uh, from, from that last cadence. Great, so that's the four, uh, four of three. Let's see what happens in the next chord. The next chord is the a chord built on C minor, C, E flat, G. Okay? And uh, again, this chord could work in both keys quite well. C, E flat, G is the chord of the four in G minor. Okay? And it's also um, the chord of the two in B flat major. But I think it's probably more important now to start thinking back of, about G minor because uh, if you look ahead, and always try to look ahead to see where he's pointing with this, he's actually wrapping up the entire chorale and gives you a cadence in the original key. So at this point, I think it pays to start analyzing everything back in the original key. And this would be a very important chord actually in any tonality, the chord of the four or the subdominant is very important. Therefore, I'd like to analyze this as the chord of the four. It's a minor chord, okay? And uh, built on C, C, E flat, G, okay? And uh, let's see what happens in the next chord. Ah, of course, G, B flat, D. This is the chord of the one in G minor. So we basically, we're basically done with that secondary, you know, a relationship chords. Uh, we're not doing slash notation anymore. We're back into the original key. So we have the chord of the four on the, on the first, uh, first beat and the chord of the one now on the third beat, okay? And uh, finally, you see that exact same cadence that we had at the uh, end of the first line. Okay, when we have the five with the four, three suspension and the eight to seven, um, uh, the eighth brought down through, uh, through a seventh chord before he resolves it down to the uh, chord of the one. Okay, and we have again a perfect authentic cadence in the, uh, in the key of one or G minor. Okay, excellent. Um, if you uh, guys want to know more about how I analyze this, uh, uh, these last two measures, you can go back to uh, two prior videos and see exactly how I dealt with this five to one um, harmonic progression in G minor. And that's one where I explained about the, uh, 
the uh, non-cortone called suspension, okay, the preparation, the actual non-cortone and its resolution, and we talked about resolving this uh, properly. If you look in here, the way he resolves that seventh chord that's being formed on the last beat of that uh, measure, that uh, uh, D, C, F sharp, A, okay, that's the actual 5-7 chord at the very end, gets resolved to a 1 in which you actually triple the root, okay? That's the proper resolution of the... Uh, uh, seventh chord, all right? And it's a perfect authentic cadence because the root of the chord of that last chord, it's also in the soprano, not just the bass, okay? Very good. Again, if you want to uh, listen to this uh, chorale being performed, uh, go back to my prior video, video number 26, where I'm actually performing this chorale for you to listen to uh, everything. Great, in my next video, we are gonna uh, take a look at yet another chorale by another Baroque composer, not Bach yet, and uh, we're going to try to see if we can learn some more about other non-quartones and um, a different way of looking at uh, borrowing uh, chords from other tonalities, okay? You can keep the slash notation going, but sometimes the slash notation is not adequate anymore. It's, it's great in this case because he's only borrowing a few chords from B flat major, okay? We're still in G minor and we refer everything back because he doesn't really spend too much time in B flat. He gives us a cadence and then uses a few more chords, but then he's back into G minor. But what happens, for example, when you start uh, spending a little more time than usual uh, in a different key, okay? Maybe we talk about modulation at that point. And when you modulate, you think now in the new key, not in the old key, and you stop referring back chords to the original key, okay? And we'll see in the next uh, chorale exactly how we do this. So that's in my next, uh, in my next video. Great, that uh, wraps up the uh, theoretic part of today. And uh, now uh, we're gonna go and take a look at the solfege. Solfege uh, number 42. Your assignment was uh, solfege number 41 and 42, but I will perform for you the number 42 because it's a little more difficult. Let's quickly take a look at uh, solfege number 42. It's written in B flat major, okay, because of the two flats in the key signature. And how do we know it's B flat major, not G minor? Well, it starts with a B flat, it ends with a B flat, okay? Um, there are some accidentals in there. Those are chromatic alterations of notes. Um, we don't really modulate or go through any keys in here. Uh, B flat is stated quite a lot in here, okay? So there's no reason to believe that we're moving away from B flat. We stay in B flat, so this is B flat major. Um, this one incorporates a lot of 16th notes, as you can see, a lot of ties, you know, uh, ties over the bar line, ties within the measure, combining values. There's a lot of syncopation in here um, and a chain of syncopations, not just, uh, just one isolated one, but there's quite a few in a chain here. The way to practice this, again, it's very slowly, one or two measures at a time until you learn it or you memorize it. I wouldn't suggest memorizing it because uh, these uh, solfege exercises are also very good uh, reading exercises. I want you guys to read instead of just memorizing things, okay? Practice with your keyboard so you sound all your pitches in your ear before you uh, commit them to uh, memory and go very slowly, okay? Once you have all the pitches, then you uh, start uh, uh, learning the rhythm. Okay, and you can learn the rhythm separately from the pitches just by doing what we do in, in the star exercises. Uh, you can ta through the, uh, through the rhythms, uh, through the notes, instead of sounding the pitches, okay? But then you have to put them together, the pitches and the rhythms together, okay? And then you put two and two measures together and so, and you, uh, this could take some time though, if you're, if you're, uh, uh, a little challenge doing this, it could take some time, but it's really good for you, so I would definitely suggest you spend the time uh, doing this.
Okay, good. So we're in B flat major. This is the tonic chord, B flat. <clears throat> okay. So um, actually, let me uh, put the metronome on. I'm gonna slow this down to uh, let's see if 70 is good. 70 should be fine. If 70 is too fast, uh, then uh, I'm gonna slow it down even more. Again. I do this because there's a lot of seven, uh, 16th notes here. If the uh, note values were a little bit slower, then a faster tempo might be justified by, uh, um, so let's see, let's bring the volume up. This is 70, B flat, C, C. Fa sol fa mi fa sol fa mi fa sol fa mi re si si la sol fa mi fa fa sol fa si re so sol fa sol si sol fa mi fa mi re fa mi do la si re do si la si la si re fa si sol do la si re fa mi fa sol fa mi re do si do re mi fa la si Re do si do si la si re fa fa sol do si la si Fa fa mi fa si fa mi fa re fa do do re si mi mi re do si do re mi mi fa fa sol do sol fa si fa mi fa mi re fa sol fa si fa fa do mi mi re mi fa mi re mi do fa mi fa si si do do re mi re si fa sol fa re si do fa mi fa re si Okay, that will have to do. Still quite fast, at, even at 70. Uh, you have to really, really know all these notes. The better you get with solfege, the easier this will, uh, will seem, okay? So uh, you can see why you really have to work slowly on this, okay, until you master it. Very good, let's move on to the um, star exercise. Star exercise is number 41. Let's uh, quickly look at number 41. We're gonna keep the metronome at 70. And uh, what's employed in here that we haven't quite had up to this point is ties. Ties over the bar line, ties within measures and so on. And uh, you know, rests and different combination of patterns. He's combining now patterns with the uh, help of the ties. Okay, so let's see. This is in, uh, it's in two four, I think two difficult there, but uh, let's see, you have some double dotted quarter notes here, so you have to sustain them. Okay, I will show you exactly how this is done. Metronome at 70. Perfect. All right, so you have to uh, practice this slowly, okay, one or two measures at a time. Repeat them on and on until you got the pattern. Add two more, put them together, and so on, okay? It really pays to uh, work slowly with these uh, exercises. Great, for next time, um, I will perform for you the number 42 from uh, Robert Starr. So uh, your assignment, it's only one at a time at this point. You can see these are a little longer. They're like eight lines long each. So uh, Mr. Starr wants you uh, to work a little harder now than you did before, all right? And I will perform each and every one uh, of these uh, for the next couple of uh, chapters or so, okay? So number 42 from Robert Starr and Solfege number 43 and uh, 
44 for next time, okay? Very much uh, in the same lines as the uh, star exercise, employing 16th notes, rests, uh, combining patterns with ties over the bar line internally, and so on, okay? And uh, your metronome should stay at 70, I think it's good. All right, great. On my next video, we're gonna look at, uh, at yet another chorale um, from the Baroque period, of course. Um, but uh, this one is gonna be a little bit different than the uh, uh, Johann Kruger one. Uh, we're gonna learn a little bit about modulation. Okay, modulation, when it's when you actually switch keys and you stop referring everything back to the original key. Possibly because the composer right now spends a lot more time um, in, in the new key, okay? To the point where you pretty much start to forget. You know, your, your internal ear, your brain starts to forget the original key somehow because you're spending a lot of time in the new key. And we're gonna learn about pivot chords and things like that, okay? And hopefully uh, some more non-core tones. There's a lot more non-core tones out there that we need to study and, and look at. And, uh, you know, we'll take a look at this uh, starting uh, next time when we look at yet another another chorale, okay? Until then, I want you guys to stay healthy and uh, happy and safe and uh, be good.